Are you ready to praise the Lord? Are you ready to praise the Lord? All right, that's way better. You know what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 113? Praise the name of the Lord, you his servants. And then he said, let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. That's forever and ever and ever. And then he also said, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Oh, friends, we gathered this morning, right, church? We gathered this morning and praised him. And now the going down of the sun, we're praising him again. Amen. Are you ready? All right, let's go.
church tonight. I know we sing these beautiful songs about God coming and moving and His Spirit coming and filling this room, but I feel like I just see a couple question marks on a couple people's heads tonight, and that's okay. But I just want to remind you the reason that we're asking Holy Spirit to come and move is because things change when He comes into the room. Everything changes when the King of Kings is on the scene. Everything changes, so whatever you came in here for. I believe that the Lord has given me two things that someone came in here believing for, and one is that you've been struggling with a disease that the doctors have deemed that are completely incurable for so many years, and you're here as your last resort tonight. Friend, I believe that you are going to be healed in Jesus' name. And the second thing is that someone is coming in this room tonight believing for a spirit of forgiveness to come upon them, that you have felt it so difficult to forgive that person that hurt you, that person that wronged you, the person who doesn't deserve your forgiveness, friend. Jesus went to the cross to forgive you of your sins so that you can forgive them. And I believe tonight that there is a spirit of forgiveness in this room. So we're gonna sing this again, that miracles happen when he moves. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that a miracle can occur tonight in the presence of God? Come on, we're gonna sing it till we believe it, church. Are you ready? Come on, posture your hearts before the Lord. We see miracles. Cause miracles happen when you move. Healing is coming in this room. Come on, miracles happen.
Take a personal moment and just worship. 
Open your mouth, let your spirit song come out. You don't have to have the lyrics on the screen behind me. Father, we bless you. We worship you. We love you, Lord. We sing our song to you. We lift our hearts to you, Lord. Be glorified in us. Be glorified in their praise. Be glorified in this place, Lord. We welcome you. We welcome you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. We welcome you. Come move among us, Holy Spirit. Spirit, as we've gathered tonight, it is truly our heart's desire that you would move so mightily in our hearts, in our lives, that you will produce a measure of change and transformation in every single one of us. Because we recognize tonight, Father God, that you're the potter, we're the clay. Enlarge our hearts, shape us, mold us, make us. As we move through the evening of teaching, let that which is being imparted to us become part of us and produce the change you need in us. Father, we ask you to grant that now as we make our petitions known to you in and through the powerful, almighty, authoritative name, Jesus. And the church said a good, try that one more time, church. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Would you do that with me? Amen. 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 I'm going to ask you to remain on your feet for just a moment as our folks return to their seats. Just stand on your feet if you would for a moment, please. The Bible says that when Jesus rose and ascended on high, he gave gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Teachers play a unique role in the body of Christ, and too often it's not recognized or elevated enough. I've said this for years. I, I preach for a response, but I teach for change. I am confident that the entrance of His Word will bring light and understanding to us, and out of that new revelation, light and understanding, we'll see change happen in our daily lives. Tonight, as we did on Friday night, have a choice gift from God that is going to be under this roof, on this platform, that is going to bring revelation to, I would have to say, all of us. After having sat through Friday night, I'm convinced, all of us. Are you ready tonight for what God's going to speak into your heart and life? Amen. Then here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your hands together and give a warm Life Church Tampa Bay, Florida welcome to the guest, Dr. Caroline Leaf. Come on. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, Good crowd tonight, I appreciate it. I know your team is playing tonight, the Buccaneers. I was in a hotel surrounded by Chicago Bears and Buccaneers, so I kept quiet. Anyway, welcome tonight. 
Uh, just briefly on the products, we did very well on product sales on um, Friday night. We have some left over, but if you want to order and we run out of our, uh, inventory, we'll ship to you free of charge. So there is a special two of Dr. Leaf's latest books, and um, they're selling for $30, save yourself $12. Um, I'm the subject of most of the books. I've been married to the brain for 33 years, so you can get a lot of wisdom from there. So I'll leave you in Caroline's capable hands. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Who was here on Friday? Oh, wow. Welcome back. Okay, so those of you that weren't here on Friday, okay, the ones that were here, what's this? No, it's not a dead tree. It's a toxic thought. It's very much alive, causing brain damage, unfortunately. But these are, so these are the things that we need to capture and renew. So on Friday, I spoke about the, what a thought is and what memories are and what the brain is and the mind is. So I'm going to do a quick recap of that for five minutes, then teach you some new stuff, and then we're going to do a Q&A. So this is your brain, just in case you didn't know. I'm sure you did. Okay, so your brain is not your mind. So the first thing I want us to realize is that you are not your brain. Your brain doesn't do anything if you're dead. The reason your brain is doing anything right at this moment is because you're alive. So your mind is what drives the brain. So the mind shows up in the brain. And your mind is this huge aliveness that we can explain in terms of physics, electromagnetic fields and gravitational fields and all kinds of stuff. And it's your aliveness. It's, your, it's powering up the different parts of your brain and your body. So without the mind, the brain and the body will disintegrate. Without the brain and the body, the mind can't show up. So you've got to have them working together. The key is, is that we, with our mind, have two parts. We have our, or we have two sort of kind of ways of operating. One is in our wisdom, and the other is in our messiness. So we have a wise mind and a messy mind. And with our wise mind and messy mind, we, that are supposed to be working together, we experience life. So now I'm talking, you hear at, a, at church, you're hearing me talk, so this is the experience. You are taking my words and the images and everything I show you. These are all sound waves and electromagnetic light waves. Your mind is what's grabbing all of that. So I'm shooting all these photons at you and sound waves. Your mind grabs that, makes sense of it, and on the, that's on the physics side, on the psychological side, your mind is thinking, feeling, choosing, thinking, feeling, choosing, thinking, feeling, choosing really fast at 400 billion actions per second, converting my words into products inside of your brain. So your mind grabs what you're hearing and seeing, pushes it into your brain, and your brain responds on all these fancy levels, electrochemical, neuro, neuro, electromagnetic, neurochemical, etc., and genetic. And my words and the, whatever you're seeing are becoming protein, tree-like structures in your brain with all the content, which are the memories, built into vibrations inside proteins. So basically, you're growing trees in your brain that are made of proteins and they vibrate. Okay, and when you, when you are processing with your wise mind, messy mind with wise mind, you'll build healthy green trees. They're not really green in the brain, but they look different. The proteins fold differently and they just have a healthy structure and they generate a whole healthy state of brain and that then influences the body because whatever you build into the brain immediately influences the body. So the brain and the body are made of about 37 to 100 trillion cells which is a lot, and as I'm speaking now, not only are you growing this in your brain, but that is sending an instruction to the rest of the cells to also build what I'm telling you into every cell of your body. And you're building all of this into the, the, um, the gravitational fields of your mind. So thoughts are these things that you build with your mind, they're physical structures, and they're made of memories. So mind is not the same as brain, Mind shows up in the brain, and as soon as it shows up in the brain, it grows a tree, that's the thought. So the product of mind are thoughts, and then the, those influence your body, and your, they have these gravitational fields in your mind. So what does that feel like? As you're listening to me now, you are, as I'm talking, you're doing all of this stuff, 
by paying attention. And you're also, as I'm talking, you've got all kinds of thoughts that are popping from the non-conscious to the conscious mind, which we'll dive into a little bit more when we do the Q&A. But can you, as I'm talking, you're aware of other thoughts, aren't you? And that's good, that's correct, that's what happens. So in any one day, you are gonna use your mind to go through the experiences from the time you open your eyes, read the email, have the conversation, get ready, go to a workout, go to work, do whatever it is that you do. All of those, it's about 8,000 to 10,000 experiences that you have in a day. And all of those experiences, each and every one, as you read the email, as you have the conversation, each is being fed by existing thought trees with their memories. So thoughts are trees with memories on them, built into them, built onto them, like branches and roots. The roots are the source and the branches are how you interpret them. So each and every one of you is hearing the same message, that's the root system of the thought tree, but each and every one of you is interpreting what I'm saying according to your own unique way that you think, feel, and choose. So your branch part is different to everyone else's. So your uniqueness comes out in how you see and understand and perceive. So that's the standard thing that's happening. And as humans, we actually designed to control that process, which is mind management. We designed to control that every 10 seconds, which is pretty powerful. So it doesn't mean you look at your watch every 10 seconds. What it means is that you are very able to self-regulate what you are thinking, feeling, and choosing. What does that look like? As you converse with someone, how are you structuring your words? What is the impact of what you're saying on your body? How's it making you feel? How, what, is that, what does that person's face look like in response? Are they getting upset? Are they getting angry? Or they, are they happy? What is the tone of the email you're sending? In other words, you can constantly monitor that conversation that you are having with yourself, that thinking, feeling, and choosing, and building those thoughts, and the impact of those thoughts in your communication. So you, you, you build the thought, and then the thought is what you communicate from. So I'm not communicating from fresh air. At the moment, I'm communicating from thoughts that are in my, in my brain, and my body, and my mind that I've built over years of experience. So, everything you say, and everything you do, which can be collectively called your communication, is based upon a thought that you built, and a thought is based upon your experiences, and it was informed by existing experiences. So in any one day, you can have up to 20, 30, 40,000 thoughts going through your head. Around about 8,000 of those you are building, it's new stuff, and then the rest are old ones informing the new one, old thoughts with memories informing the new one. Okay, so why am I telling you all of this? To show you how brilliant you are, to help you understand that a thought is not the same as a memory and your mind is not the same as your brain, but they a whole lot work together and the biggest thing is that you can control this. So with your wise mind, working with your messy mind, you can learn to manage your mind. And that is basically managing those intrusive thoughts, that people pleasing, that FOMO, those, those anxiety attacks, those panic attacks, those reactions you're having. You don't have to be consumed or controlled by those. You can use those to find out why you are experiencing any of those or all of those. And you can then make them work for you and not against you. Because if you get stuck, in toxic intrusive thoughts that make you feel like you're completely overwhelmed or you're getting caught in people pleasing or overgeneralization or FOMO or FOPA and all these words that are being bandied around all over the place, which is basically we are thinking just becomes a mess. That isn't who you are. You are showing up like that because of. So if you have a toxic experience and it may be a toxic conversation or a toxic experience at work or you had something in uh, early years of your childhood or adolescence, whatever, we, we, we have adverse experiences on an extreme at any, in all day long, all, all life long. Just some days it may be worse than others and some time periods of your life worse, worse than others. A toxic experience looks like a toxic tree. So it's toxic. The roots, the cause are toxic, and the processing and the interpretation are toxic. This is real in your brain, but the proteins are folded wrong. So this means that your brain is being damaged, which means your body's being damaged, which is why you don't feel so good when you haven't dealt with your stuff, which is why people pleasing or fear of missing out or in the intrusive thought or that panic attack or that anxiety or feeling frustrated or hating someone or get whatever, all the things that we go through, they don't feel great because they are causing damage in your brain and your body. And if you grab those feelings, 
in your mind, brain, and body, and all those signals, you can actually control them, get the message out of them, and change what they look like inside of you. If you don't, then they get worse, and over time, increase your vulnerability to disease by 35 to 98%. You don't need that. Okay? You also don't need your immune system being, being um, uh, compromised, especially when there's something like COVID floating around. You definitely want your immune system, uh, in, immune system built up. You want resilience in your mind, which builds resilience in your brain, which builds resilience in your body, and therefore also, obviously, in your immune system. So if you are really frustrated about something and really angry about something and really mad at someone and you don't want to forgive them, I put up a post today about forgiveness, you are actually causing yourself brain damage by building this that toxic thingy in your head, this thought with its memories, which are all the details, the source is there, your interpretation is there, so this is the experience, this is how you're seeing it, and this is actually that weakening your immune system, your immune system trying to fight this thing by sending out immune factors, exactly like it does with something like COVID virus, to get rid of it. But if you don't forgive, disconnect, um, if you don't forgive, deal with that stuff, process, get through it, all that stuff that you spoke about getting in the garden on Friday night, that Jesus got in the garden. If you don't get in the garden, face your stuff and go through it, even though it gets often, get, it basically will get worse before it gets better, it's going to explode because these are volcanic. So we have to deal with our stuff. We will increase our immune system's response to the point where the immune system then, instead of working for you, starts working against you. And then your whole body gets so totally confused that you start getting all kinds of aches and pains and so on in your body because of the, what's happening in your mind. Messy mind, messy brain, messy body, messy life. But you don't have to stay like that. You can clean up the mental mess. Now, here's a key thing. It's actually okay to make a mess. It's not okay to stay in the mess. And that's what bringing all thoughts into captivity is. It's capturing that mess and it's managing the mess. And the system I've developed to do that is called the NeuroCycle. But before I dive into that, and we're going to also unpack it in the questions, let's have a look at some slides. We live in a current era that tells you that if you feel weird or you feel depressed or sad or whatever, you have a brain disease. It's not true. So let's look at what is not correct and then look at the correct truth. So we are, need to move from believing the following. Illness and diagnosis we need to move from believing that illness and diagnosis, um, we need, sorry, we need to move from the concept of when you feel panic, anxiety, depression, um, not overwhelmed, burnt out, can't carry on. You don't need a diagnosis of a brain illness, That's not because that's not what it is. You need to recognize that you, it's your personal narrative and you need to understand it. So whatever you are feeling and experiencing that's making you not feel like you know, that's toxic, that's making you feel like you can't, you don't have peace, you can't process forward, that is coming from this thing. So if you embrace that feeling, and then that, what that will do is this, that will pull this up from the non-conscious to the conscious mind. When it moves to the conscious mind, it becomes very weakened. And when this is weakened, and I'm shaking it because the protein branch is weakened, you can change it. So by you embracing your behaviors and your feelings and your bodily symptoms and your perspective of life, you get control over these. By suppressing them, they control you. And then that, then, then that comes with a big dose of hopelessness. So I'm here to tell you tonight, you, need, you actually can be hopeful. Hopelessness is one of the main underlying causes of suicide. When people feel hopeless, and pointless, very often it's also tied into their identity, okay? So we've got to be very careful of when we feel these things to listen to the current narrative which tells you that you have a clinical diagnosis of X because depression and anxiety are not like something like cancer or diabetes. That system, that biomedical model of diagnosing and treating symptoms works for that, but it doesn't work for when it comes to the mind. Because your pain is not coming, the emotional pain is not coming from something hiding in your brain waiting to explode in a mental illness. It is coming from what you are experiencing, your narrative. Who are you? What's your story? What are you going through? If we had time and we could sit and just share our stories and we'd be crying and we'd be sharing and be telling each other our stuff and supporting each other, that's 
what we're supposed to be doing because each and every one of us in this room is battling with something and maybe a bunch of stuff and that's okay. It's okay to be messy. Embrace your messiness in order to repair and grow. Okay, so then the next point here is we need to ask what has happened to you, not what's wrong with you. Okay, what's wrong with you is judgmental, it's harsh, it makes you feel like, oh, I'm a bad person and you're not. You're made in God's image. You're wired for love, okay? So that's such a beautiful concept. I don't have time to dive into that. That's like a whole teaching on its own. But I have a book called The Perfect You where I really dive into it. But scientifically, there isn't any structure in your brain or body or mind that is wired for toxicity. We're wired to make a mess and to clean the mess, okay? So that, and you can't clean the mess unless you make the mess. And why do we make a mess in the first place? Because you've got free will, okay? So who gave you free will? God. I lay before you, life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. So God knew you were going to choose the wrong thing. So God accommodated that in your mental and physical design. Okay, isn't that amazing? So you can make a mess, but you've got to fix it. And that's what I'm here to tell you is make the mess, embrace the mess in order to fix the mess. Okay, so we don't want to ask what's wrong with you. We want to ask what's happened to you. So the next time you are feeling freaked out and like overwhelmed, just say, okay, that's not who I am. Something's happened to me. There is a big cause of. Let's look at the next slide. You see, when you feel distress, even extreme distress where you cannot get out of bed or you're in such a panic attack or you're disassociating or all those fancy psychological terms where you are falling apart and collapsing or a loved one is, it still doesn't mean you have a mental illness. There's not some hidden thing inside your brain waiting to jump out. It is what it is, is it's your mind, brain, and body trying to deal with the adverse circumstance and your mind, brain, and body telling you with very strong signals in terms of things like depression and anxiety and pain in your body and the, all the you know, disassociation, all those kinds of things are signals telling you to pay attention. There's a big cause of. Can you hear the difference? The one is condemning and the one is totally free. If I tell you you have a brain disease, where's the hope? Okay, it's scary. And you don't need fear on top of a sad story. If you're in extreme distress, you don't need fear. Okay, so let's move on. It's not a, if you're feeling extreme distress, it's not a disorder, it's not a disease, it's not a dysfunction, it's not a dysregulation, it's not a chemical imbalance. So we need to move from the concepts when it comes to mind stuff. We need to move away from the concept of treatment and cure because it's an ongoing process, we need to move away and understand the impact of psychological injury on our mind and body. So if I experience terrible abuse and it's repeated, that each experience is being built into my brain by my mind, okay, because my mind is how I experience life, I think, feel, choose, and I'm gonna build toxic thoughts. The more extensive, pervasive, and the length of time that I'm in that abusive situation, the bigger the toxic thought. So whatever you are thinking about the most is growing. And that's causing more and more disruption in my brain and every cell of my body and feeding back into my my mind. So I'm feeling awful, okay? So that experience is going to then create damage in the brain and the body. So what I've shown in my research, and Mac, you can bring up the slide, you're gonna get changes in your bodily function, the way your body functions. So we're gonna look at, for example, um, cortisol. We've all heard of cortisol. Cortisol will increase. So you'll see a slide coming up that shows you cortisol as cortisol increases, sorry, as unmanaged minds increase. So if you don't manage the situation and get support in the process, your cortisol levels will go beyond the normal healthy level and start creating havoc in your entire system because everything works together. So cortisol raises, it will also raise homocysteine and homocysteine is a marker of inflammation. Cortisol we see in excess in people who have committed suicide, who have died from suicide, not better to say than committed suicide because it's a marker of a complete, a system that's completely breaking down, an entire mind, brain, body system. But if we manage our mind, this reverses. So as your, an unmanaged mind, an increase in, call, in homocysteine levels, which means an increase in inflammation, but it reverses. If I, if I manage my mind, I can reverse that. And I showed that with mind management, within nine weeks, you can stabilize and reverse high levels of cortisol, which will put your brain and heart and body at high risk. Homocysteine, which increases your, decreases your immune response 
and increases your, your vulnerability to disease. So within nine weeks, 63 days, which is the time it takes to rewire neural pathways with your mind, you can reduce those kinds of things. So what I found in my most recent clinical trial, which I put the summary in that book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, um, but I just want to show you some inside the brain quickly, then we'll look at a couple more other slides. Let's back, if you can bring up the head maps for me, it's in this book here that I'm talking about, and all these slides are in there as well. Okay, so there, look up there, this is inside the brain. When I work with people, um, I don't practice anymore, but when I do clinical trials and when I did practice, I, and I've trained physicians and therapists around the world, I always will look at all factors. Most important is who are you, what is your story, what is going on in your life? And that story is going to change over time as you start to understand the because of. I also always look inside the brain in terms of how is the brain responding to the messiness of life. And then also at psychological scales, which give you a little bit of an indication of how you're feeling emotionally. And then also look at things like your blood, like homocysteine and all that kind of stuff. I also look, and I mentioned this Friday, at DNA, which is, tel if you look at the telomeres specifically, and telomeres are the, on the, end, are the ends of chromosomes for those of you that weren't here. And they are considered what we call a proxy for how you're managing your mind. Guys, what I'm trying to tell you is I'm bringing you a bunch of scientific medical stuff to show you that the spirit soul body link is real. If we don't manage, if we don't capture our thoughts and renew our mind, our telomeres will get weakened. And when our telomeres weaken, the million cells that you make every second will be weaker, which means every system of your body, every organ and system of your body gets weaker. So over time, without capturing thoughts and renewing the mind, we are going to have a physiological response, a neurophysiological response. There is going to be an impact of the psychological trauma, and, of the un and especially if, if it happens and also if it's unmanaged. But when we start to capture the thoughts, when we get in the garden like Jesus did and go through our stuff, we can reverse those things in our body. I mean, that is amazing. So we saw in nine weeks people's biological age, which is the age of your cells, going, getting 30 years younger. I mean, that's like in, in, some of the, in some of the clinical trials that we did, okay? So I talk, I do this neurophysiological research to show you that spirit soul body connection is real and that you're, if, you're, if we manage our minds properly, we can actually change this physiology. So as you capture a thought, you are changing your DNA. You are changing your cortisol, you're changing your homocysteine, you're changing your brain. So what you're seeing up on the screen here is one of our subjects in the trial, the recent one, where they came into the, and did all this testing, and their story, and I'm just giving you the brief outline, was I am depression. That was their identity. Those were the opening statements of the story. And then the rest of the narrative of the day one was all about what this person couldn't do, how they were such a mess, how their life was a mess. But the huge part of it was they had, their identity was shot. Totally hopeless. They just said, there's just no hope. I am just a huge mess. Very sad, okay? Homocysteine levels through the roof, everything, all the markers. This person had a body 30 to 35 years older than their actual age, which is crazy if you think of it. Okay, so a lot of things going on there. So what you're seeing inside the brain there, if you look at the first row, what, and you look at the top, that's the nose, and the side is the ear. So we're looking, we use various different electrodes in different places in the brain, and that looks at the energy response of the brain. Remember, the mind is energy. That energy is showing up in the brain. In response, it's taking life as energy, putting it in the brain, and the brain responds with energy. So we read, the, we look at the energy through using different readings, um, millions of them, to work out what is actually going, what, what's, you can't read thoughts, but you look at the response of the brain. Now, the easiest way to understand this is think of the sea. Think of the huge waves far out to sea, the huge swells. As you move closer into shore, the swells get a little bit smaller. And as you come up close, the swells then build into the big wave. And then the top of the wave gets a white crest. It hits the beach and breaks up into tiny little waves. And the whole wave gets sucked in and the cycle is repeated. And that is a beautiful waveform. By the way, this is just a side note. Did you know that no waves are ever the same? So every single wave is always its own unique wave. We can apply that to you as humans. Every thought that you think is your own unique, uni your own unique thought. You've never thought this thought before, and no one will ever think the thought in the way that you're thinking it right now. 
You see, you type you. This is how unique we are. It's phenomenal. And that's power. That is incredible power. And we know that we have a love power and a sound mind. That's your core. That's your wired for love nature, made in God's image. At your core, your wisdom is love, power, and soundness. We'll dive into this a little bit more in the Q&A. Okay, so the first row you see up there is a lot of blue. And when we call a, a blue brain, it's called a blue brain, is when instead of having that beautiful waveform across both sides of the brain, which is stimulating a really healthy blood flow and oxygen and all the chemicals are doing what they should be doing and brain resilience is high and you're building things properly. Instead of that, blue means it's flat line. So there's Flatline, there isn't enough energy in all the different types of energy frequencies. And that's not good because your brain, that means that your mind, it's an evidence that your mind is messy. Your brain needs a lot of that wave energy in all the different forms for your brain to function properly. So when we step into the wise mind, which is always operating with a correct waveform, and that you're a flat line, so the messy mind's in the flat line, the wise mind is in this waveform that's perfect. If we connect with the wise mind, which is our inner core of how we are made in God's image, and that's obviously connected to the Spirit of God, you can then bring wisdom into the situation and you can bring healing in. And the system of the neurocycle that I've developed helps you to do that. So capturing a thought and renewing your mind is basically tuning into the wisdom of God and managing these thoughts, okay? And then, so when this particular subject was then, uh, uh, once they were tested, I load, the, not myself, my team, because it was what we call a double-blind study. So in order not to bias it, I was not there in, in the actual clinic on the day of testing, on any of the days of testing. I didn't give them therapy, nor did anyone else. They simply got the neurocycle in an app form. So it was on their phone, they worked on it themselves. The point being here is that I want to show you how much power you have in you. I'm not saying that you mustn't go for coaching and counseling and therapy. Each of those do three different things. They are fantastic. They support roles. But you can't be fixed by someone else. Okay? As Jesus demonstrated in the garden, Jesus turned to the disciples and said, can you be with me? So people will be with you in different roles, your family, your therapist, your counselors. Everyone plays a different, slightly different role, but it's being with you. It's not fixing you. Only Jesus could go through what Jesus went through in the garden. Only you can go through your stuff. You've got to feel it to heal it. Okay? So essentially what happened here was that the subject then went off and went, began the journey of feeling it to healing it. 15 to 45 minutes a day going through the system of the neurocycle, which is basically a way of organizing the mind to drive the energy correctly through the mind to find the messiness and to find the reason behind the messiness. In other words, not what's wrong with you, the what's happened to you. So the neurocycle helps you capture the thought and renew it to find the what has happened to you. And then to help you to reconceptualize that, look at that correctly through wisdom. Like you know God loves you, you know that you all things work together for the good of you, all of that stuff. You're going to translate just from those scriptures into specifics in your life. So the neurocycle helps you take the pattern in your life and all the signals that are screaming at you from your body and your and your brain and your and your emotions, etc., and turn that into finding the reason, upending that tree out of the garden, the roots and all, and reconceptualizing it into a healthy new way of looking at it. So that's what renewing the mind is. So I pretty much spent 38 years studying how to do that. So let's have a look at another. Um, okay, sorry, sorry. So let's keep looking at this. So now this is what the subject did. And after 21 days, they came back. And their brain had gone, was, all the blood started changing. Um, the story was different. At this stage, the subject said, hey, I'm not depression. That's not even an identity. I am depressed because of they had started seeing the suppressed trauma from childhood and how they had pushed it down and how it had messed their life. And I mentioned this Friday night that this happens so much with my patients, that once you start seeing why you are like you are, it's really sad. You're going to grieve and you need to because when you have had terrible things happen to you, there is a sense of grieving. But it's in seeing those and facing those that you can then step into wisdom in God's arms and you can then redesign that. That wasn't supposed to happen. That, wasn't, that isn't who you are. You're not that worthless person, etc., etc. You can reconceptualize it. So the gray is now an indication when the brain is doing that wave thing, that the proper wave thing with the big waves to the crashing on the beach with the little waves and the, all the breaker in between and so on. We see when that's happening across the left and right,
outside of the brain, the brain gets shades of gray. It looks different for everyone because everyone has their own unique pattern of thinking. So the green you see at the top, the light green color, shows that that person's identity is coming back. I have value. I see me. It's looking in that mirror and, and, and literally looking in that mirror and seeing you and actually meeting you for the first time. Sometimes all of us, sometimes people don't want to do that. Do you know that most people don't like looking at themselves in the mirror? Because you kind of think, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not that. Meanwhile, you are amazing. You need to look at yourself in the mirror and see who you are. You need to see that inner core person who's made in God's image. And that's very often has been drowned out by all those toxic experiences. So this is a way of you starting to see yourself more clearly. 21 days is not enough time to create sustainable changes in the brain. You'll start having very good insight, but we all think, you know, you hear 21 days to build a habit. Absolutely not. If you, if that subject stopped there, if my patient stopped at 21 days, if you stop at 21 days, that work that you've done, that new little tree, it's tiny. It doesn't have enough energy to influence your behavior. In other words, you will know that's how I want to be, but you're over here caught up with this huge chasm between who you are, seeing how you see yourself now and how you want to be, okay? So you're gonna have this huge chasm and that's gonna lead to tremendous frustration. Most people, unfortunately, you don't have ever, haven't ever heard this kind of teaching before, people give up within three to four days, five days, because that's really a hard, it gets very hard around day five, because we start seeing stuff and it starts being revealed. So we've got to push through. You've got to push through the pain. You're like, Jesus pushed through the pain. Jesus got beaten up. I mean, going to the cross, it got worse. But then Jesus rose with the wounds in his hand. And the wound is your story. As I said on Friday, and I say this all the time, you can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what's in you. Okay, so essentially, that's what you've got to push through. So at day 21, you're going to get a good level of insight into where you want to go. But then you have to stabilize that, and you have to expand that, and you have to grow it more like you water a plant and it grows. So and that takes around about another 42 days. So it takes around nine weeks. Now, most people say to me, I don't have nine weeks. I don't have 15 minutes a day. I bet you you scroll on Instagram for more than 15 minutes a day and feel bad when you're scrolling on Instagram. I bet you you're doing stuff that you could turn into something constructive. I do my detoxing neurocycle when I'm getting ready in the morning. So it's a pattern. It's a behavior. I'm attaching the neurocycle to an existing behavior that I do every morning, which is get up and get ready and clean my teeth and put on makeup. And that's when I do it. Okay, so, f so that's what you should be doing because, and when you finish one 63 day cycle, that doesn't mean that you're done. That is just the beginning. That's gonna reveal to you, oh gosh, this has permeated other areas of my life. And then you go and start another one. And if you think I can only think of one, I can't just think of one thought. One thought, think of a tree. Does a tree only have one branch and one root? No, it has hundreds, maybe thousands of roots. The roots are the source of what you went through. So, and, and, that's, and those are the memories. So the roots of the tree are the memories in the thought and the branches are your interpretation memories. So there, as you are working through the one thought, you're gonna be working on up hundreds, maybe thousands of memories. So each day there's gonna be a lot of stuff to unpack. So you're thinking of one category for 63 days, but within that category are all the data and the data are the memories. Does that make sense? And then you just keep doing this. Once you've done one, you'll see it'll lead to another and you live, learn to live a detox lifestyle. Now, as you're doing that, something incredible happens. Resilience starts building in your brain. I don't have time to teach you all this stuff, but you listen to my podcast, cleaning up your mental mess, get the books. You'll see that there's all kinds of different ways you can apply the neurocycle. But very quickly, as you're doing the 63 day thing, you then get so used to the system of the neurocycle the five, it's a five-step process that as you work through the five steps systematically, very simple steps, but when you do them in the order and you do them the way that I teach you and you prepare your brain beforehand, you are actually gonna drive the neuroplasticity of your brain. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to change. Your, chain, your brain is never the same. So if you say, I don't have 63 days, in 63 days time, your brain has still changed, but in the wrong direction. If you're not controlling it, then you're being shaped by the world. You're being shaped by others. You're being shaped by things that are just coming at you. You need to be discerning. You hear this so often in church and you read this in the scriptures. Be discerning about what you pay attention to because what you pay attention to is gonna grow in your brain. 
So if you just bamboozle your way through the day, just letting everything grab and knock you over, you'll feel knocked over. That's the kind of mess that is going to be causing those telomere things to shorten, okay, and increase your vulnerability and increase, you know, all that physiology stuff going wrong, okay, drop your immune system function. But if you say, okay, I've made a mess, I just got irritated, or I just wrote a really ugly email, or just, or I've um, got this pattern in my life, I don't feel bad about that, it's okay. Those patterns are signals. If you embrace them, they have messages, messages. And as you embrace them, you can then find why. There is a why, there is a because of, there is a what has happened to you, there's a story, because that's not who you are. That is how you're showing up because of. Tell yourself that every single day. Every time you snap at someone, every time you fight with someone, every time you get mad about something, every time you catch yourself doing something that you wish you never did or said, done it, been there, okay, got the t-shirt, catch yourself. I am 81% more effective in doing this. I show in my research that you can learn to manage your mind, you become 81% more proficient. I promise you 10% will change your life. If you get your mind under control just by a 10% factor, you will not believe the changes in your life. So I'm telling you this is science, this is the science of how to capture thought and bring all thoughts into captivity. And science is totally spiritual because science is the how-to. That's what science is. Science comes from the word sclera, which means knowledge, and God is the source of all knowledge. So therefore, I bring you a piece of knowledge. And that piece of knowledge is how to capture thoughts and bring them into captivity. How to use your choose life. How to use your love power and your sound mind. I'm giving you the how-to. So that you don't just say the scripture as a band-aid but you actually live the scriptures as a lifestyle. And that's what you're able to do. I'm gonna ask Pastor Ed to come up now on the stage and we're gonna unpack a few of these things in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Are you learning something? Are you excited? It's so exciting getting your mind under control. And you, you, when you realize, hey, I don't have to be a victim of this. I don't have to get stuck in this pain and this trauma. I can actually, it doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, you, they're not going to go away. What happened to you is going to be there, but you don't have to let that control you. You have the ability to change how it's inside of you, that toxic tree, into a healthy tree. Therefore, you have the ability to change how it plays out into your future. That is a powerful mind, and that's what you are. Could somebody say, Wow. <laughs> Dr. Lee, for years, obviously, as a pastor, I have rehearsed and um, recited and leaned heavily upon that passage that you have referred to throughout both Friday night and tonight of not only taking captive our thoughts, but the passage Paul gave us in Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to the world. You mentioned it just a moment or two ago. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And I want to say thank you publicly for helping us understand that it is a process, it is a journey that is one that we are going to be on continually until we see Jesus. Because um, as you said, you get through the first 63 days and you start the process over in another compartment of our lives. So I want to talk about that for just a few moments. Uh, I want to kind of lead in with this, this question. Could you please give some clarification to the terms? These are in your books, obviously, so we're going to be familiar with that. Non, non-conscious, subconscious, and conscious minds. Help us understand that. I'm so glad. It might help if I have a mic. I'm so glad you asked that question because... If you, this is such a, it's, it's, it's phenomenal, it's very powerful. Okay, so the, the, you've got a messy mind and a wise mind. Those are the, the sort of concepts, but how your mind is divided is into three levels. So we're talking now spirit, soul, body, because mind is the word I use collectively for spirit, soul, and body, which interestingly enough, if you go back in the ancient texts, scientifically and philosophically and spiritually, mind is spirit and soul. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good term to use for that. So your mind has got these three divisions. At the moment, you are all conscious. Hopefully, none of you are asleep. So when you're awake, your conscious mind is awake. Your non-conscious, N-O-N, conscious mind operates, however, 24-7. 
So the non-conscious mind is the biggest part of you. It never stops. It's the part of you that has got all of your experiences built into these trees with all these memories from the certain point in the womb to the age that you're at today and will keep adding with every moment that you add new experiences, which is constantly. So your non-conscious mind has got all, everything about you, the core, your wired for love nature, as well as every experience that you have. So the conscious mind is only awake when you're awake, whereas the non-conscious is awake 24-7. So at the moment, your non-conscious and your conscious are working together. So when I said earlier on that as I'm speaking, thoughts are popping into your mind, they're popping in from the non-conscious to the conscious. And then they go back and they come up and down, different thoughts, and you're doing that right now. Now what do they go through? The subconscious. So the subconscious is the bridge between the two. And the subconscious is a very, every level is spiritual, but the subconscious I often liken to like the, the Holy Spirit kind of, you know, tapping you on the shoulder or prompting you or something like that saying, you know, listen, listen to these things. Look at what's coming up. This is evidence of, you know, where you are at and what's going on. Because if you pay attention to what's coming up, you get tremendous insight into what is going on in your life and how to manage it. Because if you really listen to those messages that are coming up, you will find that they are always accompanied by a level of wisdom. And the, and the easiest way to visualize this is to imagine a massive big forest, a huge one, endless. And I want you to all imagine that you're in a little helicopter. And this helicopter is like a time machine. You know, back to the future, but it's not a car, it's a helicopter. Or it's a car. I don't mind if you want the, to be the Dorian. <laughs> Whatever you want, okay? So you're in this, this time thing, time capsule flying thing. And you are the pilot, and the pilot is the messy mind, because the pilot is navigating. And you don't know what's coming up, experiences-wise, what people are going to do, what's going to happen. So there's a lot of uncertainty, so you don't quite know what your choices are going to be. You might predict, okay, I'll act like this in this situation, and then the situation arises, and you don't act at all like you planned. And you think, how did I do that? And that's okay. That's the messiness of life. You are, as I keep saying, your, your design got accommodated. Knew that you're going to do that. The big thing is do it and then fix it, okay? Not just leave it. Don't just pretend it's not going to be there. So here you are. The co-pilot is the wise mind. The co-pilot is the core of your being. It's the made in God's image. It's the love, power, sound mind. And visually, it's the, it's, uh, the co-pilot has a direct communication to the middle of the forest, Okay, so now visualize this beautiful forest and visualize a strip through the middle, Revelations 22, 1 through 5 style, okay? So beautiful green trees, exquisite perfection. You've never seen anything like it. That is the core of your non-conscious mind. That is the core of the beautiful design of your brain and your body that your non-conscious mind works through. That is this wired for love thing that is energized and connected to the Spirit of God. Around this beautiful green forest are all the other trees, different sizes, different color greens, some dark clusters, some really dark clusters. And some of them are really, some really dark trees are down the side of this forest. And you might find that you're stuck in the other side, in the middle of these trees, and you're battling to get your wisdom. So you kind of got stuck in that messiness. What we need to do is we need to always get ourselves back into the middle of the forest and we do that by listening to the co-pilot, which is our wise mind, and seeing life from that angle. So when I say things like, you are made in God's image, or that's not who you are, that's how you're showing up, and you, you're incredible and brilliant. I'm not, motiv I'm not a motivational speaker, I'm a scientist. I'm just telling you what I know as a scientist, that when you, that you are actually designed to look at yourself from this inner core of wisdom and evaluate everything from that angle. So if you're in your helicopter now and you're flying over this forest that I've just described, whatever it looks like in your mind, this visual activity, by the way, is very good to develop your intelligence. So we're doing a little intelligence developing exercise as I'm describing this. So as you're flying over, just see maybe if there's certain areas that are really drawing your attention. And if those areas are like spouting off maybe some smoke signals. And maybe you've been flying over those and you go, I don't want to face that. And you just keep avoiding that all the time. And the co-pilot keeps saying, hey, go pay attention. And you say, no, I don't want to. And you just, you know, you ignore the co-pilot and you keep crashing. Okay. Now, maybe today you get back in that, that helicopter and you're flying over it again. And you see, okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to pay attention. You land the plane. You listen to the co-pilot, the co-pilot, and you land the plane, you get out and you face that forest. But you've landed the plane in the green middle part in the wise mind. And you're now listening and working with, and now you're tuning into the Spirit of God, and now you're pulling on wisdom. And that's 
that is involved in the neurocycle, what I've just described, is the brain preparation that gets you into that mindset. And then you start doing the work of, okay, now that I'm aware of this, how do I start dealing with it? Okay, so I know that's a long answer, but I want you to understand that the non-conscious is constantly driving. And if I listen, if I just ignore the voice from the middle of the forest, the wise mind, which is coming from the non-conscious, I will miss out on that wisdom that is in me. If you recall, Friday night I spoke about this as living in prayer. I don't, you know, prayer's got many different faces, but this is real prayer, in my opinion, where you're constantly talking to the Spirit of God. Isn't that what you're supposed to be doing? Yeah. Okay, isn't that, are you the pastor, okay? So here I'm talking about, you can have your little bursts of prayer for specific things, but you should be talking to God all day long. I mean, right. that's what the scriptures say. So, but do, are we doing that? We, we don't. We just go through life, and, oh gosh, you know, I better wake up and do something, you know, do a Bible study. Oh, I've done my thing. And then you go back. That's, that's flying with the co-pilot, the messy mind, the Wise mind and messy mind working together means that you're going to tune into the depths of your non-conscious and really tune into what is going on in your mind. And as you do that, you will pull up wisdom. Does that make sense? Yeah, it did, because what you just did for me was you helped me understand the difference between prayer as an activity and prayer as a conversation. I love that. Beautiful. Okay, um, this was a, an amazing illustration right here, the toxic and, and the healthy. Can you help us? Okay. My wife loves to do things with, with her plants and gardening and, and things of that nature. There's an old expression, you know, we've used around the house, you know, go pull some weeds, you know. Yeah. Uh, weeds being toxic yes. to the healthy growth. Yes. Okay. H help us understand how to determine in the course of our gaining wisdom and, and, and getting healthy in our thought life. Help us to understand how to identify a toxic thought versus a healthy thoughts so we don't pull out the good stuff and leave the bad stuff. Good, excellent question. And as you know with weeds, if you just chop the head off, the weed will grow no, back. It comes back, yeah. So if you just pop a scripture on like a positive affirmation, you know, you just say, okay, I'm going to memorize 20 scriptures and I'm just going to say that every time that thought comes up, you're not doing anything except mm -hmm. chopping the head off. You have to get to the root cause. What has happened to you, the because of, and that's in the roots. So you have to land the plane, get your spade out, and with the co-pilot, go dig around the soil to reveal the root. And that's what you're doing daily over that time period, okay? So how to recognize it? How do I know I must land my plane? Do you, mem do you remember a few moments ago I spoke about what's, as you're flying over, what cluster of dark trees catches your attention? Did you remember that visual? Okay, so now what are those things coming off? Those are signals. So in order to find the toxic issues, you get signals. Those signals are coming from your mind, your brain, and your body, your spirit, soul, body, which in science we call psycho, neuro, Biology. Fancy word for spirit, soul, body, but such a cool word. I love it. Psycho neurobiology. So what you do is you are going to listen to the signals. Your mind, brain, and body work together to tell you that is an imbalance. That's a threat to the love nature, therefore a threat to your survival. That is causing brain damage. That's messing with your telomeres. That's messing with your homocysteine, etc., etc., etc. So your mind, brain, and body tell you. How does your mind, brain, and body tell you? Through your emotions. So emotions are not illnesses. Emotions are never bad. There is no bad emotion. This may be news for you. Because now you're thinking, oh, well, isn't, isn't hatred a bad emotion? No, not if you manage it. Because if you are hating, remember, you're wired for love. So you actually can't hate. What you're doing is you are generating a signal that is telling you that something's going on. So when you grab that hatred, which is very toxic because of, of its nature, um, and it's, and it's, and you see it as something, okay, this sounds contradictory. Let me explain that again. That when you, it, that hatred is an emotion. It is not a bad emotion in the sense that it is going to help you. It is bad if, it, if you, or toxic if you keep in the hatred because your body has no design for that. But if you see that as a signal, not as a state that you're in or, or a part of you, it's not your being. Okay, it is a, a temporary state that you are in. It's a signal that you are shooting out that is actually your mind, brain, and body telling you to pay attention because it is, there's a reason why you feel that hate. You can't, because you can't logically be hate because you love. Do you get what I'm saying here? So it goes contrary to our nature. So everything about us is rejecting it. So the, the more you feel hate, the more your body's actually rejecting because you're gonna feel it physically in your body. So along with that hate, you're gonna feel the physical reaction in your body. 
There's people, there, there's, there's cases in science documented of people hating so much that they actually die. Their bodies, their bo the, the organs literally just give up. The heart just gives up because it's so out of alignment. If you think hate, if you let hate consume you. But if you don't, if you want to stop hate consuming you, you do then need to see hate as a useful messenger. Oh, I've got hate. Hate's not the best place to be in. It's damaging to my body. So what does it mean? Why do I feel hate? Do you get what I'm saying? So that's the first thing is to ask yourself, what are those emotions? So it's to gather awareness of the emotions. Then the other signal, the second signal, there's four categories of signals. The second is then, as I've already mentioned, what's going on in your body in response? Now you and I both know, all of us know, that we've all hated someone at some point in our life. Don't tell me you haven't because then you're lying. Because I know you have, because I have, and all of us have. And uh, but the point is that if you stay in the hatred, as I said, it's bad. It's, right. That's the problem. But that hate, when you felt that hatred towards someone, very often it's a protective thing. Someone's hurt you or a loved one. So you hate them for it. And, and, and what you're hating is the whole thing that's happened. And you, you know, that, that's what, your body feels it. You feel consumed. You can feel like your heart can get sore. You can get aches in your body. We're all going to manifest with something or a combination. Can anyone identify with what I'm saying? You feel it, okay? So that's your body saying, okay, this is real. Every cell of your body is, had that experience that caused you to hate. And the experience is coming from outside and went into your body. So now the body's spewing this out of it and you're feeling it in your body. So your mind is telling you through the emotion. Your body is telling you through what your body is feeling. So tune into your emotions, tune into your body. Then the third one is what are your behaviors? What are you doing differently? What are you doing, in other words, doing, saying, acting in your relationships at work, in your life? What are you doing that's, that's just not you? That's definitely a new thing. Maybe you've been doing this new thing for a few weeks, a few months, a few years, but you know in the depths of your wise mind, when you really take the time, that that's not who you are. That you, you, you don't really act like that. You don't, you're not a person who's constantly irritable or a person who's constantly seeing the, what it, like fighting with people or whatever it may be. What is the, or withdrawing. So whatever, there's a million different behaviors, million plus different behaviors. So look at your behavior signal, that's different. And then look at your perspective, your mindset. How are you looking at life? What is, and, and I'm talking about attached to this particular cluster of, or, or it could be a single thought tree with all its memories, or maybe it's a group. So the fourth one is your perspective. Do you find that you are, when you focus on this pattern and you've identified the signals and the behavior, so the hatred, the sore heart, the, um, with, uh, the, a lot of anger outbursts, um, and maybe the, so that's the three. And the fourth one, I just, I, I hate this whole whatever, whatever, this whole concept, or I hate life, or life sucks, or something like that. What is your perspective? So what is your overarching view? What sunglasses are you putting on? Okay, so those are the four categories. Within each of those is an infinite number of different details. But that's what you pay attention to. And those four signals come from you identifying a pattern. So step one is to get in your helicopter, literally in your mind, and fly over that pattern that's a, 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 constant, a constant in your life, that thing that's making you lose peace. So right now ask yourself, what right now at this moment is a pattern in your life that is actually something that seems to be disrupting your sense of peace, your creativity, a relationship, all of the above? I don't know, it's unique for each of you. Okay, try and grab hold of that. Now that's what you're gonna land your helicopter. That's the name of the tree, okay? And now, but just as we're about to land, the helicopter, or you can have landed already by naming the tree, look for the four signals. So what are the, and you're not gonna solve it all in one day. This takes 63 days. So you can just pick one signal for each. So what are you, as you think of this pattern, what's your emotion? What's your body feeling like? What are the behaviors that you've noticed associated? You can do this slow, I'm just giving you an idea. And what is the perspective associated with this? You know, it's amazing when you sit down and do this work, it is uncanny, because we're so used to being very busy. 95, 96% of people battle with intrusive thoughts that are um, disruptive. 100% of people battle with intrusive thoughts. 
And this is a way, and those intrusive thoughts are indicative of these patterns. So when you start sitting down and analyzing this, flying the helicopter, landing it, and whatever visual you want to use, you start seeing things differently. Now remember when you do this, what's so key to tuning in is to be kind to yourself. Mm. Kindness is absolutely key. Yeah. Doesn't matter what the awful thing is that you're doing and the awful thoughts and the awful behavior, it's not you. So you've got to come from a position of kindness. If you come from a position of that inner critic, I did a podcast just the other day on the inner critic, you know that one, I'm stupid, I'm not worthy, I can't do this, I always get this wrong, you know that kind of thing. That means that you're on the other side and you're looking through the toxic trees instead of being on the inside, the wisdom part, the green part of the forest. So kindness, if you want to get into the middle of the forest fast and tune into your non-conscious mind where wisdom is, be kind to yourself. Amen. So preparing your brain is vital. So I'm stepping back now. Before you've even, you know, you've identified the pattern and you've maybe identified the signals, but it's really important before you start doing the work that you get into a place of kindness. Kindness completely transforms your brain. Those waves flow correctly, blood flow increases, oxygen increases, your frontal lobe operates differently, your impulsivity drops. You can hear the Holy Spirit, okay? Mm. And you can't hear the Spirit of God when you're on the other side, looking through the toxic. So if you are criticizing and hard on yourself, stop and tell yourself, yes, what you've done is awful, but that's okay, it's not who you are, you did it for a reason, that's why we're gonna fix it. That's the sort of language you need to use. Okay, there's a lot more, but that kind of gives you an idea. Okay, the way I process, this is a really cool moment for me, I'm having a conversation with her, this is good. <laughs> um, the way I process is um, illustrative, I, I, I love illustrations, um, and I wanna be careful not to oversimplify such a, such a complex situation, a matter. But I'm gonna ask you in a moment to drift back to some of your, some of your explanation on, on Friday evening and I'll, I'll get there. The way I'm hearing and processing right now what you're saying is that if we were, if I was an airplane pilot and I was flying at a certain elevation and I was having difficulty maintaining my elevation and I began to lose altitude, Holy Spirit being my co-pilot could potentially draw attention to the warning signals on the control panel in front of me. And the co-pilot, by the way, is you also. You are messy and you wise. The oh, wise mind connected to the wisdom. The wisdom is the, is the spirit of God. So that's why wisdom, Solomon said, is the principal thing. Exactly. Okay. But you've got to choose to get into wisdom. So you've got to choose to listen to the wisdom in you to connect to the wisdom of God because we are made in God's wisdom. Okay. Now, thank you for clearing that up because I messed that up. <laughs> Messy mind. No, um, it's, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay. Here's where I want to go. Because this was so powerful to me, sitting on the front row, my mouth just dropped when you were helping us to understand there are no negative emotions in the sense that they're bad. Yeah. Okay. But rather they're our friend because those are the warning indicators that something is wrong. Exactly. So rather than looking at the what, we should be asking the why. Exactly. Help us understand that one more time, please. Okay. So... Every emotion is a beautiful gift from God, whether it's the hate, anger, or, or, or passion. Let's take those, I mean, they're totally different things. One would be, we would say, we would classify passion and excitement as good, and we would classify anger and hatred as bad. I know there's good anger, okay? But they, none of them are bad, because every single one is a messenger. The louder they shout, the more those signals in your plane is going all over the place. Mm -hmm. So they, if you don't pay attention, your plane crashes. If you don't pay attention to those signals, you crash. Yeah. So instead of suppressing them with medications or scriptures or positive affirmations, you know, using Band-Aid kind of for thinking God is a genie, if I just, you know, quote the scripture, you have to do the work and you have to say, why am I feeling like that from a position of kindness? Okay, why, am I ha why is that hatred in my life? Why do I feel such a strong reaction to those people? Why am I getting so triggered by what that person is saying to me? Mm -hmm. Why am I getting so, so you need to create space. Can I use these analogies please, now to, please, to explain this, this more? Okay, so what I've got over here, I've got this really cool analogy that I'm gonna show you. This may help to explain this too. 
I've got three different size glasses here, as you can see. I'm sure that I'll be zoning in on this, okay? And I'm holding a little rock, okay? And this is the issue. This is the relationship issue that you're having. This is the frustration with your boss at work. This is the overwhelm from just this last 18 months. This is the isolation that has whatever, okay? So grab this. This is maybe the thing you grabbed, the pattern that you grabbed earlier on, okay? So as this now, this little rock, it stays the same. Watch, it doesn't change. I'm not changing it. I'm not doing any magic tricks. It stays the same, but watch the position and the space around it. In the midst of the issue, I am completely consumed. Can you see there's like no space wow. around this thing? I can't see the wood for the trees. I am standing on the other side. I'm not in wisdom. There's no space. I can't see. I'm caught up in the brambles, the, the thorns, the pain, the emotions, the frustration. Why did they say that? Why are they doing this? I can't understand this. It's so hard. God, why? That's this. You are consumed. Your body's breaking, etc., etc. You can't get out of bed, whatever it is. Now you start saying, okay, this is not me. This is not me. The emotions that this is generating, the behaviors, the signals in my body, and the perspective. Those aren't me. They're just telling me something. So that emotion of anger and whatever is telling me something about this and about this space. So if I pay attention, okay, what is that emotion? What is the behavior? What is the body feeling? What is the perspective that is attached to this? When I stand back and I'm kind and I do all the stuff I describe, guess what's happened? I've now moved this little stone into this. Same stone, same issue, but what have I got? Space. Yeah. I've started creating space. When you stand back from something, you get perspective. How wow. many times have you taken a photo or you want to look at something and you stand back to yeah. give yourself space? Yeah. That's what we're doing here. So when you basically start going from the signals and tuning in, and this is what the system of the neurocycle is doing for you. It's the, this is what capturing your thought is. This, there's a thought, you captured it. it. It's initially captured in that cup. And in that cup over here, if you take, go to Jesus in the garden, here it is. If you go to Jesus, if you go to the analogy of Jesus in the garden, this is as you enter the garden. You're all consumed. You're in agony. Now here I'm getting more space but I'm seeing what's going on. So my grief is increasing. You gotta to go to the, you know, this is where you start screaming out, why God, take this from me if you can. But you need to see what's going on there. What's the root of this issue? And then as you get, it gets worse before it gets better, whatever, you suddenly get to the point where you rise from the cross with the wound Amen. in your hands. Amen. You have space, you now know what's going on. And from, you now know why. You've got enough space to stand back and see what's going on. So this still happens to you, but now it's been transformed into, I like this tree. This is nicer than my one. Can I grab it? Take it. Yes. There. Go for it. This is really looks like the brain. So cool. Now, <laughs> this is this in my garden. I still know there. Look here. It's inside. But it's inside there. It's not causing death. It's been reconceptualized. Wow. Into how wow. I want it to play out. This is your trial turned to your testimony. This wow. is those... One day, a young woman came running up to the front of the stage when I had finished. I can tell you a million stories, but this one's just popped in my mind at the end of a session like this and said, I just want to tell you, Dr. Leaf, that I was trafficked. This person was trafficked. She was raped more than 100 times a day for oh. a period of time. And, but, but first, when she ran up, I thought my first reaction was, what a beautiful person. Not only physically beautiful, but there was such a light shining out of her. It was like, wow, I just want to, I just want to see this person. And she proceeded to tell me how she had, how she went through from hate and went through this whole journey and how she can now, she's reconceptualized to the point where now she helps other young women. So that's very typical of um, how we can take our pain and transform it. That's what I'm describing. I'm giving you the how to and all these analogies. But if you run from that hatred and you think I, you justify to hate someone who rapes you a hundred times a day, if you raped, you, you justify to hate, hate there's, there's a justification there. And that you need to go through in the garden. You need to say, I hate these people that did this to me. That's part of your healing. Get it out. Okay? You can't just, oh, I forgive them. Not, it's not gonna, you, you're lying to yourself. It's first hate. It's first get it out. Why do I hate? Because they took away my, all of who I was. They did this. They forced that. Say it all. God, why? Scream it out. And then 
get control. Then you say, okay, well, it happened. I can't change it. It did break part of me. But now how do I want to be? And that's where we need the support of others. That's when Jesus said to the disciples, can you be with me? You need to be with each other. So she now is in the disciples' position where she helps other people who are going through the garden. Do you get this? Does this yeah, make sense? that's excellent. I'm going to find my stone. you got to find the stone now. Got just, the stone. You don't want to lose yourself. Space. Yeah. And, and you know when you were doing that, the first thought that popped into my mind when you said you need to create space, in the moment you're creating that space, you're actually being kind. You're being kind. It's the first yourself. thing. This, the kindness, you're totally right. The kindness takes us from that cup to that cup. And I mean, there's obviously a lot in between, but it just gives you the concept. You know, if you think of the concept, what's very popular in Pastor Ed at the moment is talking about boundaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost nauseatingly spoken sure. about. It's, and it's, it's important, but people have also taken it, I think, sometimes to the extreme, which happens. It's, you know, that's yeah. what social media does. But bound, the concept of boundaries, I have now decided to stop talking about boundaries and talk about space. Wow. So what you want to do is you want to, you can't give from, you know, the oxygen mask concept, put the oxygen mask on yourself. When Jesus got in the garden, Jesus is demonstrating the oxygen mask. You've got to sort yourself out and face your own issues. And while you're doing that, you need to create the space. So if you are stuck in a position where you can't, where, you, where your issue and everyone else's issues inside this cup, it's a lot of crowding going on. You can't help anyone. You're just going to break and so is everyone else going to break. Right. So you have to get everyone out of your glass, take your glass and get in the garden and sort yourself out. And in that process, you will then start stepping into wisdom, and wisdom operates in love. And love has, a, has an all-conquering frequency, literally. Love has a frequency of 528 hertz plus, and fear has a frequency of 4 hertz, which is the stronger, I ask you, okay? So we have to get ourselves into that healthy state and start with a kindness. Then we can reach out and help others. It doesn't mean that while you are in that process that you can never help someone else. But a true boundary is saying, okay, that you in my face in this way is stopping me getting any perspective. I'm just getting worse and I'm disliking you more and more or whatever. You may use other words. You may want to use other words in that. So I don't like you anymore. You may want to be a bit more subtle. Just say, I need some space to process so that I can look at you differently and you can look at me differently. So there's this concept that applies to boundaries too where you actually can then create the space. And then as time goes on, the space increases which gives you perspective. You can apply this to absolutely any concept if you think about it and when you move from space to space you gain that much more freedom absolutely the freedom is like massive over yeah. now here in that person who's toxic hopefully they've done the work but if they haven't you're now going to look at them with empathy you're now in a strong enough position that when they trigger you you won't get triggered the trigger doesn't trigger anymore what it does is it brings this up in other words, your response now, this, Amen. Em this emanates the love frequency, which means you literally, from this in your brain, you're shooting out love photons, which are photo Einstein's work. You, I'm generating photons towards you at the moment, so is Pastor Ed, you're generating back to us. That's who we are. We are e electromagnetic. You are generating photons. But because we're in a healthy conversation here, they are good photons. So if you've got yourself in a good space, you're generating photons that are like that to that person. So when they trigger you, you're not going to be broken and incorrectly... And and react in the wrong way, you're going to have the ability to respond in the correct way. Responsibility, ability to respond. See, responsibility is the ability to respond. You can't have responsibility or the ability to respond until you create space and create these. Hey Amen. Can you give some appreciation? What a weekend. Oh, man. Dr. Leaf, I know I'm speaking for everyone in the room. Thank you. My pleasure for investing your life over these past nearly 40 years in helping people find spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical health. Thank you. And I think that I would hope, I would hope that every environment you go into where you're giving of yourself like you have on Friday evening and tonight with such a willing spirit, I would hope that people would, would accept the responsibility of expressing gratitude to you in a right way. So church, I'm going to ask you to stand in honor and appreciation of our guest who has given so much this weekend. Thank you. Amen. To wrap up our moments together, um, we're very familiar with 
the blessing that is spoken over the congregation of Israel. We love it. And, and this, I'm going to read it real quick and then move to something. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, I went there because I wanted you to see that, that closing moment of, of peace. But Paul, in his writing to the church of Thessalonica, this is a, this is a passage that my wife has built our, our sisterhood women's ministry around. When he said, this is his closing moments to the church of Thessalonica in the first letter. It's his blessing and admonition. Now may the God of peace, let's catch that. The God of peace himself sanctify you, means separate you completely. And may your whole spirit, and I'll add whole soul and whole body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. And then he makes this statement, which I'm going to fulfill. Brethren, pray for us. Father, as we're wrapping up this particular moment, I just pray for every person in the room that as we, we have set under such incredible teaching this weekend that is going to help us increase our measure of health spiritually in our soul and in our body. Father, I pray that you will help us and guide us in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Go out with a song. Grab with a song. You good? Let's grab with a song. Come on, put your hands together. Let's begin to praise him for a moment.
think of a better song to close out this night and this entire weekend. Amen. I pray that Holy Spirit will continue to water the seed that has been planted in your heart. It was a lot to take in, right? Yeah, I echo my husband's words. Wow. But... You have some next steps here, and we're happy to tell you, go out to Dr. Leaf's table, and you'll see this card. They have an app that you can download, and it will help you with the neurocycle that she was talking about. Just remain standing with me just for a few moments for a few more announcements that I have. She also has books out at the cafe lobby at her table. You need to check those out as well. Also, you know, this is the time of year where we have a lot of outreaches going on. I'm not going to go into all those details. We've been telling you about them already. But go out to the info desk and you can get more information about those. And also, we just want to say thank you for your faithfulness in giving. As you give faithfully God's tithes and your love offerings, you keep the cycle going. You keep that cycle of giving going. God gives you the seed, and as you sow it and prosperity comes, you continue that cycle. And so uh, we have, uh, no, not on those screens, but we have many different ways to give. And so we just encourage you to do that. We also have the boxes in the, uh, as you are leaving the sanctuary, for you to give your offering as well. We will see you next Sunday. <laughs> God bless you for coming.